coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I don't measure my portions. I do not count calories. I eat until I am comfortably stuffed, until until the point where I get a, another piece of meat on my fork and go, oh, I'm done. I can't because I think that's the way we always did it. Right. Right. And if you're eating a proper human diet that contains foods that humans ancestrally ate, I think that your hunger hormones and your other satiety signals will tell you that's it, Bubba, you're done. No more. Right. But if you're eating highly processed, ultra processed, high carb, low fat foods, you never get that signal. And so you can definitely overeat even on a paleo diet that was, you know, full of uh, spaghetti squash and quinoa and sweet potatoes, I could overeat all day long. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interviewed Dr. Ken Berry. He's a family physician in Camden, Tennessee. He's also the author of the best-selling book, Lies My Doctor Told Me, which exposes myths and misleading health advice from well-meaning doctors. So in this interview, we discuss Dr. Ken's own health journey, his problems with MyPlate government guidelines, misconceptions around cholesterol, also keto carnivore with kids, and should we eat dairy? We also discuss his morning routine, his fasting and eating ritual, how to raise testosterone naturally, and his one tip to get your body back to what it once was. So I really enjoyed this interview with Dr. Barry. I know you will too. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin, and I have a great guest today, Dr. Ken Barry. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, I got a lot we could talk about today, but before I get into that, perhaps maybe just give the, the guests a little background on, on how you got into health and wellness. And, um, and I know you're, you know, board certified family physician and, but you take sort of a different angle on some things. So love to hear that. Yeah. So I'm a family physician, uh, board certified and have been practicing for over 20 years in the emergency department, obstetrics, and uh, the majority of my practice in my clinic. And I've seen a lot of patients. <clears throat> and during the early years of my practice, <clears throat> I started to gain weight and uh, just got really fat and sick, to sum it up. At my worst, I was 297 pounds and had a hemoglobin A1C of 6.2. So I was very pre-diabetic, very obese, uh, very inflamed, had multiple medical issues that I just couldn't seem to get a handle on. And so in my journey to fix myself, because I really did not want to be that, that fat, sick doctor that proceeded to walk into patients' exam rooms right. and then lecture them on how to become healthy when I myself was not the picture of health. That was very uncomfortable for me. So I started looking and all the resources I found from my medical school nutrition education and from the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association and the MyPlate uh, Food Pyramid guidelines were unhelpful, mm. completely unhelpful. So I, I thought, well, I've got to do something. I can't, you know, I'm going to be 300 pounds soon. And so I just started looking outside the box and found a, a lot of resources while not uh, consensus science, while not, uh, you know, uh, enshrined by the powers that be, mm. they worked for me and they were easy. They were sustainable. All of my laboratory values got better eating this way. And so I started to share that with my most morbidly obese patients, people who were scheduled for bariatric surgery because they also had failed all the diets many, many times. And I started to share what I had learned because they could obviously, when I walked in, they're like, whoa, doc, what happened to you? You look great. And I said, well, if you're interested, I'll tell you. Yeah. And so I started to share it with my most metabolically ill, morbidly obese patients. And they started to implement these strategies and they started to lose weight. Many of them canceling their bariatric surgery mm -hmm. 
in favor of eating a diet that was based on our ancestry, based on that nature, uh, was a very clean diet. And so then I thought, well, gosh, why would I not share this with all my patients? And what year was this when you had, when you weighed 297 pounds? Oh, uh, probably 2005 or six, somewhere in there. And, uh, I, you know, I, when, when I got on the scales, that was a wake up call. But then when I got my hemoglobin A1C back and I was moving full speed ahead towards type two diabetes, that was the last straw. I was like, you know, this is dumb. I cannot be a fat diabetic doctor for the rest of my career, for the rest of my life. I can't do that. And uh, so I, I thought, well, I'll just, I'll really, I must not be listening to the advice mm -hmm. that I give my own patients. I must not be walking the walk. So I went back and reviewed the, the my plate and the ADA and uh, just really got serious about that and started jogging two or three times a week. And after three months of that, my A1C had actually went up and I had gained a few more pounds. And it was that, that was the epiphany for me that this is never going to work for me because I really tightened up <clears throat> and I did exactly what I was supposed to do. And I got sicker, not better. And so at that point I said, yeah, I've, there's gotta be another way. Yeah. You talk about government guidelines, for, you know, like the, my plate. Um, and I was looking on your website cause you have some stuff regarding that. What, what is, what, what would you say is wrong with that? I mean, we, we both know, but why don't we touch on things that are wrong with that? And then, and then how, what you did to sort of, um, you know, make it right. Yeah. So the, my, my plate guidelines or the food pyramid, mm -hmm. they are, it is recommended it's in black and white in their guidelines that this is for healthy adults only. That's, that's who that guideline is for. But when you start looking at the numbers of metabolic illness in the United States, only 12% of us don't have at least one marker for metabolic syndrome. So right off the bat, the, my plate guidelines are only for the 12% of Americans Right. Uh, adult Americans who have no markers of metabolic syndrome. And that, and so what about the 88%? What are they supposed to do? Did the federal guidelines create that 88%? Because if you, if you go back and look at the numbers before the guidelines, before 1977, obesity was a rare thing. Uh, people in their uh, mid forties to, to, to seventies, if you ask them, in your first grade class, how many fat kids were there? The answer is invariably either one or none, mm -hmm. right? And now if you go and you look at the average first grade class, the obesity prevalence is 20, 30, 40%. So you can't, you can't say this is a genetic thing. To say that this obesity and type 2 diet in any way is genetic, is that's just foolishness, right? You can't even hang your hat on that nail. So it has to be something in our environment. It has to be something that's different now than it was before 1977. And I think there are a number of those things. And I right. think correct all of those things, your body returns to its natural state because I believe for, for the human species, just like every other species of, of mammal, when you feed it a species appropriate diet, its default is vigorous, good health, right? right. And that's, that's the baseline. That's not the, the goal or that's not the thing you're working for. That's just what it is. You're just naturally healthy and vibrant and vigorous and strong and fast and smart. That is the baseline state of all mammals. So why are 88% of adults in the United States, why are they not at that baseline of good health? There's got to be specific actionable reasons. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm a fan of also Dr. Jason Fung, cause I'm, I'm a big, I'm big into fasting. I know you are too. And he talks about in his books, uh, you know, back in the on our 50s, 60s, no one had six meals a day. They had those three square meals. Granted, maybe they maybe even weren't even the healthiest meals, but they, they didn't snack and they didn't have all these small little meals. And that's another trend that has changed, right? Where essentially people are eating, thinking they have to eat all day long to sort of feed their brain. 
and right. stay and stay and stay and have energy. I I was in that camp. I remember I used to get, you know, a little inkling of hunger and grab for like a kind bar or something to sort of keep me satiated throughout the day. Uh, now I'm obviously to one to two meals a day and I have more energy than I ever had. Um, so yeah, it, it's amazing how uh, the information that's being fed out through the government, it probably through a lot of deep pockets, um, is just wrong. What would you say the main thing about that is wrong? Is it, is it the recommendation of grains? Well, I think it's all of that. I think Dr. Fung is exactly right that mm -hmm. humans are not built to, to graze. We, we are not ru ruminants. We're not herbivores that should graze constantly for 16 or 18 hours a day. I think that's a big part of this. Right. Uh, any, anytime you start talking about federal government guidelines, you have to start talking about legislators. You have mm -hmm. to start talking about lobbyists and you have to start talking about billion dollar corporations because that's, that's how it works at the top, right? No, I don't think anyone can argue with that. And so uh, Nina Teicholtz in her book, The Big Fat Surprise, Gary Taubes in his book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. And then also in my book, Lies My Doctor Told Me, we kind of break down where the guidelines, how, how did they, how were they actually formed? And, you know, the average person who trusts everyone at, at levels of influence would think, well, I'm sure they got a bunch of scientists in the room and they pulled all the old research and they looked at the way human beings have eaten for thousands or tens of thousands of years. And that's, and then they put all that together, the very absolute best thinking and best science. And that's where the guidelines came from. I mean, what rational adult wouldn't think that because mm -hmm. that's how it should be done. I think we can all agree on that, but that's not how it was done. What happened was, is they came up with a kind of a skeleton framework of what they thought the guidelines should be. Then they promptly turned it over to uh, billion dollar agricultural firms and billion dollar food corporations and said, what do you think about these guidelines? These two special interest groups, there's no other way to put that, right? Mm -hmm. They put their own tweaks, they changed some things drastically, and then they sent it back to the federal government committee. Now you would think in the rational world that the committee would say, obviously they're trying to make money. Obviously they're trying to sell wheat or they're trying to sell you know, skim milk or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we're just throwing that junk in the garbage and said, no, we're going to publish this based on the science. Well, that's not what happened. And uh, this has been documented very clearly how it actually happened. And so the, all the recommendations from, and I'm not talking about the average farmer who has, you know, 20 cows and 20 acres. I'm talking about multi-million acre farms that are owned by corporations. Right. They kept their, their recommendations in the guidelines. And so that, that literally, that bastard child of a hybridized science versus uh, basically an industry wish list, that's where the My Plate and the Food Pyramid guidelines came from. So <laughs> right off the bat, they're highly suspect to any rational person. But they really didn't take into account at all how, how have human being, beings eaten over the last thousand years? Uh, how have they eaten over the last 10,000, 100,000 years? Because all of that information is knowable and is actually known. We, we're pretty clear on what made up the diet of our very successful hunter-gatherer ancestors. That's not really up for debate. When you start digging into paleoanthropology, it's fairly clear. We ate lots of fatty meat, lots of bone marrow, lots of brain, lots of organ meat, and we would eat vegetables, plants, grass, you know, uh, dirt if we were starving to death. But our preference was always for fatty animal products. And you can't really dispute that at all if you, if you really give the paleoanthropological evidence it's due. And, but they didn't look at any of that. They just looked at what do we think right now currently, what, what is the biggest, most popular fad diet? And that was low fat. And then they handed it over to big industry and they put their tweaks on it. And voila, we have a, a food pyramid. Yeah, which hopefully uh, people are starting to realize they shouldn't follow because of people like yourself. I think there's a lot of more information being, you know, sent out to the world regarding, you know, that fat is, you know, saturated fat is good for you. Um, mm -hmm. I know in your book, you talk about cholesterol. Why don't we talk a little bit about cholesterol? Um, 
what was, what are some of the misconceptions around it and around uh, different fats and how can people go about, you know, <coughs> doing it the right way? Yeah, well, so there are several pre- misconceptions. Uh, one is that if you eat cholesterol, that that meaningfully raises your blood cholesterol. Second, if you eat lots of saturated fat, that will meaningfully raise your cholesterol and meaningfully increase your risk of heart attack and stroke. And the, this became very popular in the 60s. This, and this is a hypothesis. It's never come close to, to being promoted to a theory. It is a hypothesis that has yet to be proven. And it's actually been disproven many, many times. Uh, the, the misconception that plant fat is much healthier than animal fat, right? And so there have actually been three controlled trials done in human beings that show that if you replace the animal fat from from fat and from butter uh, and you replace that with linoleic acid, you actually have worse outcomes. And and these three studies don't get talked about a lot. I've got a YouTube video just about that, uh, about hidden science, I think is how it's titled. But we know if you go back and look at the totality of the meaningful evidence there's no doubt that human beings, we cut our teeth on animal fats as a species. Uh, we evolved w- with, with animals and animal fat in our diets. There's no way you can even begin to reasonably argue that. But in the 60s, it became very fashionable to, to say you should avoid all animal fats, avoid cholesterol, avoid saturated fat, and eat uh, a plant-based diet. That's right about the time that uh, the obesity epidemic got kicked off is when uh, all this advice trickled down. And, and when I say trickle down to the citizens of the United States, I always remember that it trickled down through the sieve of big food manufacturers and uh, big agra, right? And, and I hope people know I'm not talking about the average farmer that they know who lives down the road. I'm talking about farming corporations like ConAgra and ADM. That's that's who got to put their. That's that is the filter that all this was filtered through, and made its way to the American people. And so people are now left with diets like, oh, you have to eat three meals a day, and you you need snacks in between to keep your energy up, to keep your mental clarity up. Uh, you see things like young children. Uh, you know they they're they're out for a two hour trip, and they break out the. Uh, the bananas and the the cuties at about one hour in because we don't want them to, I, I'm not sure what we're afraid is going to happen. They're, they're going to become hypoglycemic or they're going to pass out from lack of energy or they're, I don't, I don't understand why we do that, but that's just become the habit. And it's a very popular habit. It's a very socially um, accepted habit that children just need constant access to snacks. And I can remember when I was, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there in age. I can remember when we'd go on a little field trip, there was no food brought on a field trip ever. You would actually get in trouble if you tried to sneak a candy bar on the trip or something. There was, that just didn't happen. If it was an all day trip, we would break for lunch. That was a real food lunch, mm-hmm. but there was no snacks. If we were just going to a museum or to a park for two or three hours, the food was not even thought of. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up kids and I know you incorporate your kids with the way you eat. So do they, they pretty much eat, like, I know you're big into keto carnivores. Is is that pretty much how you, how your kids eat as well? Well, I've got, uh, my youngest is uh, 15 months old. And then all my other children are grown. My, my youngest daughter, she turns 18 in just a a few days. And so I don't really have control over the grown kids. (laughs) Right. But, but back it, I do. And, and I think this is a very valid mes- message for all parents out there. A lot of parents hear this message and they feel attacked or they feel shamed. Like, oh, how, how dare you feed your kids that? That's not the message here. The message here is 100 percent about hope and change and, and hope for the future. And so, yeah, I, my first kids, I fed them crap, just terrible crap. I didn't know better. Right. And even the even when I would try to feed them healthy food, looking back now, it turns out that's pretty much crap too. That none of that stuff was human food. 
And so I, I feel bad about that, but I can't go back and change it. And so I don't want any parent to hear uh, shame or, or guilt. That's not the message here. The message is now, okay, yeah, we may, we, who hasn't made mistakes in the past? You know, throw the first stone because it ain't me. But now with the knowledge that we have, we can affect the present and the future. So your kids may be grown, but you got grandkids, right? You've got, mm. you've got nieces and nephews. You've got the neighbor children. You can have an effect on the nutrition and on the development of other kids. And you can also have a conversation with your adult kids who you perhaps fed inappropriately like I did and say, hey, I hope you did. I hope you didn't learn any of those nutrition lessons, you know, too deeply in your heart because none of those are right. And so let me help you. And uh, I, indeed, several of my adult children are like, yeah, uh, I've been watching your videos, which always cracks me up. I'm like, really? Yeah, <laughs> that's weird. But they they are slowly but surely coming around because they see they remember their old fat, irritable, angry father. They remember me back then. And now they know the current me who's not any of those things. And they're like, that's a huge difference. Maybe he's right about this diet thing. And so and it, wherever you are as a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, yeah, we all made mistakes in the past. Let that go. What you can do right now is, is start to change the future for the better by making better decisions first and foremost for yourself and then your immediate family. But then also you can start to reach out and have loving, gentle, respectful influence on your extended family and even your friends. Yeah, so you're 18, 18 month old, right? Uh, so there, he, it's a boy, so he's eating, <coughs> yeah. he's eating pretty much, you know, keto carnivore am i is that correct oh he's eating 100 percent keto carnivore he uh was exclusively breastfed until about five months of age when he started cutting his two little bottom teeth that were super cute and by about that time he started reaching and grabbing things and putting them in his mouth and if you just think about how how mammals behave if he's got a, a few teeth and he's putting things in his mouth, that means he's ready for solid food. And so he's still breastfed at 15 months. Uh, she's weaning him down slowly and gently. But the very first food that he ever put in his mouth was not goldfish crackers. It was not uh, strained peaches. It was not a fruit squeezy. <laughs> it was not a squeezy. It was not, you know, gogurt. It was not rice cereal. It was a beef rib. I had, uh, we were eating ribs and he wanted the rib and I'd clean 90% of the meat off and I just handed it to him. And his, his grandmother had a little bit of a freak out because that's not something you see every day, right? Mm -hmm. That's un, unusual. Doesn't mean it's unnatural. It just means you don't see that every day. And I said, just give him a minute, see what he does. And so he, he, he gnawed around on it and you could see his face light up like, Hey, this is good. Mm -hmm. I like this. And he chewed on the rib, got all the, all the meat off, got all the connective tissue, chewed on the cartilage a little bit. And when he was done, he threw it down in the floor and he had cleaned the bone so thoroughly that the dogs didn't even want it. They're like <laughs> garbage, right? And so that was his very first food that was ever put in his mouth by his parents. And since then he's eaten all kinds of meat. He loves chicken liver. Uh, he, loves, he loves full fat, real fermented cheese. He loves all that stuff. We have given him some pickle. We've given him some avocado. Uh, we've given him stuff like that. And for his first birthday, we made him a, a carnivore cake, which, yes, that's completely doable. Yeah. And uh, we put a few blueberries and raspberries on top. We thought he's a year old. He can try, you know. And so he puts the berry in his mouth. He looks at us like, Ugh, and he spits it out. And then proceeds to eat the, the a little bit of the cake, and then he wound up eating. We all we love ribs, and so he wound up eating a pork rib. That's what he had for his birthday celebration. And, and now he does, he will eat berries, but he loves meat. He loves eggs. He loves chicken liver. And I think an important thing because most parents think in order for their child to get full nutrition, they have to eat the rainbow. They have to eat bananas from Colombia, South America. They have to eat blueberries from Canada, they Peppers. have star fruit from, right. you know, wherever they have to eat this root from Australia and this berry from the Himalayan mountains in order to get complete nutrition. All your baby needs to eat is meat and liver. Literally there will be no vitamin deficiency, no mineral deficiency 
no amino acid deficiency and no fatty acid deficiency. And your child will have to take no supplements. Now, one of the criteria for what I call a proper human diet is that you should not have to take a handful of either prescription medication every day if you're eating that diet or a handful of supplements every day if you're eating that diet. Now, there has been some modern degradation of the soil and therefore the vegetables and, and animals that come from that soil. But on the whole, if you, if you feed your child a fatty meat diet with liver two or three times a week and a, and a little bit of veg here and there, there will be no nutritional deficiencies whatsoever because that is a proper human diet for adults, for teenagers, for adolescents, for children, for toddlers, and indeed, when a baby first cuts their first tooth, that is the proper human diet for them. Yeah. And I love that because uh, I'm actually expecting a boy in end of June. So I'm selfishly asking you <laughs> that question. Yeah. Um, and so two, two immediate tips for you yeah. is do not let your wife be deluded into thinking that eating, eating liver is dangerous for pregnant women. Right, That's right. Ignorance. Do not let her be deluded into thinking she should avoid seafood. That's complete foolishness. Those are proper human diet foods. And they're, and actually, there's multiple archaeological evidence where the liver was saved for the pregnant women because they need that nutrition more than someone who's not pregnant. So I hope that you're, you're already woke to that. Yes, we have because I, uh, I, I'm into organ meats. And actually, we just made uh, beef heart uh, nice. for the first time. And it was good. I mean, it was like a like a tenderloin, almost like a beef tenderloin. And, and she liked it. So she's open to that, which is great. Um, so yeah, I know. Cause there's, there's some rhetoric out there that, Oh, you shouldn't have uh, liver because the high vitamin a, I believe it was. Right. And I, and I, when she read that, I'm like, that's just not right. <laughs> no, that's not right. And in fact, there has never been a documented case of hypervitaminosis a or vitamin a toxicity from eating liver from domesticated animals, never. Now, don't uh, she can't have any polar bear liver, and she can't have any puffer fish liver. She doesn't need those. No. But if it's the liver of a cow, a goat, a sheep, pig, that there's never been a single documented case of vitamin A overdose. And so I hope other women are going really. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. So you need the nutrition in that liver, and people have to understand it's very easy for society to make something unfashionable and to make something weird or to make something gross, right? But just because that's the current societal fad does not mean it's the truth. Right. And so I'm sure many of your listeners are like, I just can't eat liver. I just can't eat heart. That's just too gross. That, that's social training. That's all that is. If, if, if that same person's great grandfather a hundred generations removed were offered liver, they would have gobbled it up like a delicacy. This is learned behavior that society teaches us. And who's in charge of societal uh, messages? Will it be the people who are spending millions of dollars a year on advertising, on television, on the internet, magazines? That's who kind of leads and guides the the thinking. What's what's what color pants should I wear this year? What you know? What kind of what's the latest diet out there? That's ran by marketing companies. That's not ran by our genetics or what's actually nutritionally good for us or complete for us. Completely agree. Um, my other question I have for you is, and this gets brought up and it was brought up in your book a bit is fiber. Um, you know, I guess there's a lot of mixed messages out there with fiber. What, what is your thought on that? Well, uh, the, I, have, I have three tests for any question like that. First of all, what is the meaningful evidence? That's important. Mm -hmm. What is the paleoanthropological evidence, right? Mm -hmm. And then what's just common sense? And so I try to use those three tools to, to gauge any question or to gauge any new proclamation from uh, the, the Harvard School of Public Health or anywhere else, right? right? And so when you look at, when you look for meaningful research that proves that eating a high fiber diet decreases your risk of cancer or decreases your risk of constipation or decreases your risk of, of, of polyps or diverticuli, it's not there. It's non-existent. There's no meaningful evidence 
proving that in any way. The evidence that they harp on is observational or epidemiological research that basically asks people, they, they give them multiple guess questions. And they'll say, how many cups of ribs have you eaten in the last three months? And don't laugh because that's, that's almost verbatim one of the questions, like who measures ribs and cups? And secondly, hell, I don't remember what I ate yesterday, but, but they'll, they'll ask people to go back for, a, for months or even a year and they'll give these food frequency questionnaires and then they use that as meaningful data and you can't even pretend to a rational person that that's meaningful data that can then be crunched by researchers who have a bias, right? And this research is not controlled, it's not blinded. So all the researchers doing this research believe in a plant-based high fiber, low saturated fat diet. And they're asking these questionnaires that nobody can answer truthfully. And indeed there's research showing that people often fudge on these and they'll add a serving of veggies when they didn't really eat that because they don't want the researchers to judge them. And then they crunch all that data and here's this new research study uh, in the AMA or, or New England Journal or Lancet. And people, you know, if something makes it to be published in the Lancet, that should be meaningful science. But very often it is not. And when, when you know, MDs and PhDs start really digging into these studies, they often come away with a what the moment, like that's that's it, that's really all you got. And so I, multiple cultures of, of humanity have lived for thousands of years on uh, all, virtually all meat diets or all animal-based diets. And there's no fiber in any animal unless you eat their stomach contents, which most cultures and people do not and did not do. There's no fiber in that animal. And so there are repetitive, multiple examples of, of human cultures who lived very healthy for hundreds of years and they didn't need any fiber whatsoever. So you, you, and so then the common sense becomes, well, what is going on here? If, if the majority of human beings in the past never ate fiber in any meaningful amount, of course, there was a piece of grass stuck to the meat they were eating and they ate the grass but that wasn't the majority of their diet. They weren't pushing fiber. They weren't going out of their way to get more fiber. It's, it, and so it just becomes foolishness. But, and then you're left with this group of researchers like me and you and others who know this, but then you're left with the majority of the population who the only science and, and nutrition and medicine they know is what they see on CNN and Fox News and read in Newsweek and Time or see on the internet. And so when you say to someone like that, you don't need any fiber at all, that's dumb. It sounds revolutionary and it sounds, you know, just like, oh, this guy, he, he's so iconoclastic. I don't even know if I should listen to him, but it's because they just haven't taken the time and it's indeed not their job to look into the research, but the research is atrocious on fiber and many other things. Yeah. What about, uh, what about dairy? That's a common question. I yeah. Guess. And it's an excellent question. And it's yeah. a question that I think uh, some people, even in the low carb community, get wrong. Uh, dairy is 100% is of the time produced by a female mammal for her species specific babies. That I don't think, I don't think that can be argued, right? That's exactly what milk is. And so milk is definitely full of nutrition. There's no doubt about that. And some components of, of dairy, I think, are completely fine for human beings to eat. Uh, but drinking milk after the, a certain age, and that age varies based on your, your DNA and your gut microbiome. Uh, but the average, you know, if we look back in, again, paleoanthropology, we're weaning our babies at two to four years, right? And so uh, the, the, the um, enzyme that breaks down lactose starts to degrade after that time because it, at no point in human history before about four or 5,000 years ago did human beings ever drink the milk of another mammal. It just didn't happen. And, and, so, and then another great um, uh, mammalogy way to think about this is Animals are very smart. If there's nutrition to be had, they're going to figure out a way evolutionarily to get that nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. We've got birds that lay their eggs in other birds' nests and have them raise their animals. I mean, 
animals are very smart, right? But there's not a single weasel. There's not a single uh, uh, rat rodent that sneaks into other animals' camps at night and, and sucks milk from, from a, you know, a lactating bison or a lactating any, any mammal that, that's never been documented. And so I think that, that means something. And then I think the fact that human beings never drank the milk of other mammals before about 5,000 years ago, I think that means something. For the average person, 5,000 years, that sounds like an incredibly long time. But when you start really studying paleoanthropology, that's, a, that's the blink of an eye in, in that kind of time, right? And so you could safely say that for 99.999% of our existence on this planet, we never drink milk, except our mother's milk from two to four years. Mm -hmm. And then we were weaned and that was the end of it. You never had a dairy product again. So when I hear vegans or people or paleo people saying no dairy is healthy for humans or, or it's, in, it's inappropriate or it's improper or it's, it, it's inflammatory, I cannot have a big argument with them because, I mean, you know, looking yeah. at the full time spectrum of human existence, that's a pretty rational argument. Right. And so what my personal the way I deal with this is, is I never drink milk. And this is coming from a milk lover. I grew up being a football player and a basketball player. I would drink a gallon of milk a day because mm -hmm. I, I was taught and thought that was magic. That's how you're going to be fast and strong and build muscle and build bone. Well, that's foolishness. All it gave me was acne and dandruff. That's, that's what mm -hmm. I had from drinking all the milk, right? And mm -hmm. heartburn as I got older. But over two-thirds of the population of the entire planet are lactose intolerant to some degree. So if two thirds of the humans on the planet cannot drink milk, I think also that says something. We should listen to that, right? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the only macronutrient in dairy that's completely problem free is the fat. And so I definitely avoid all milk sugar 100% of the time. Every now and then I'll have a little milk protein. So, and the two predominant ones are casein and whey. But many, many people who I've interacted with have found out that it's not the lactose in the milk that causes their inflammation or causes their reaction. It's the casein or the whey. That for some people, it's very inflammatory and it can manifest itself as eczema or psoriasis, as joint pain arthritis, as gut problems, IBS. But, but we don't, we're not taught this. We're taught that skim milk is a health food and skim milk is devoid of the one macronutrient that's, that's probably not problematic, which is the fat. Mm -hmm. And it's full of the milk sugar and it's full of the, the potentially inflammatory dairy proteins. And so I, after the age of four or five or six, I don't advocate any human being drinking milk. And Cot that runs a lot cheese. of people the wrong way. Same but, thing cottage cheese same thing right yeah and so i think that cottage cheese i think that sour cream i think that yogurt are less problematic because for 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 the reason that we've allowed a microbe to go into the dairy and eat up most of the sugar if not all the sugar number one and number two the byproducts and the waste products of the microbe actually bent the protein molecules didn't it that's why liquid milk turns into a semi-solid yogurt mm -hmm. is because they've actually changed the protein structure. Mm -hmm. And I think in many cases that makes it less bad, but uh, what about it, raw milk? Uh, it, I was just about to get to that because <laughs> that's the other big question. So a uh, hundred thousand years ago, <clears throat> did our ancestors say, well, I would never drink pasteurized homogenized milk, but I'll drink raw milk. No, they didn't drink any milk. And so uh, if a weasel or a rodent snuck into the barn and, and stole milk from a, a lactating cow, that would be raw milk, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they don't do that. And so I think that raw milk, again, is less bad than homogenized pasteurized milk. But as I talk about in the book, being less bad does not equate to being good. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> um what about your ritual? I'm a big morning morning ritual guy. Actually, I just before we went on, I did a uh, little cold plunge. What what do you like to do to start your mornings? And then what is your sort of eating schedule like and your fasting schedule like? I'm curious. 
Yeah. So I get up, I, I wake up whenever I wake up. I don't have an alarm clock. And I think that's the way we've always done it. I think I don't, I'm not, I don't know if that's better somehow health wise, but why not mimic in every way we can what our ancestors did? Uh, then I, I, I'll get up, I'll have a, a little cup of coffee. Sometimes I'll put some butter in it. Sometimes I won't. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of, of making sure you get your minerals because I think a lot of the foods that we are uh, given as food are devoid of many of the minerals and there's a lot of mineral deficiency going on. So I use Keto Chow's daily minerals and I'll put a squirt of that in my coffee. And then I always try to get morning sun or, or at least morning sky. If mm -hmm. there's no sun to be had, uh, I'll take Beckett. And even, you know, it's uh, January here in Tennessee right now, and it's quite cold. Mm -hmm. But every morning he and I will go out on the, the porch barefooted and we'll sit out there and, and, you know, anywhere from one minute to 10 minutes, depending on how damn cold it is. But I let him walk on the ground barefooted and I let him be exposed to the sunlight every morning or at least the skylight if there's no sun. And we do that every day. And, and he's, he's not had a single illness uh, but I think, I think that's very good for him. In, in, and I think it's probably good for him in ways we haven't even discovered yet. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I, I start doing, I start researching. I, I am a, that's all I do basically <laughs> drives my wife crazy, but I'm always looking into this topic or that topic of going, wait a minute, why do they say that? that is that really true? And then I'll, I'll make a video or two, do an interview or two. I'm working on a second book now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, then I usually break my fast about 2 p.m., somewhere between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m., depending on what the family's doing, if we've got family visiting, where we're at in the world. And uh, it's usually with fatty red meat. Uh, often I'll add some eggs. Often I'll add some either cod liver or chicken liver or beef liver. If, I can, if, if my father-in-law's had a successful hunt, I'll add some venison uh, heart and liver. But uh, this last year, he hasn't been very successful. So we haven't had a lot of that. And that's the, and then I might eat a second time a day. And so let me talk about that meal because it's important for people to hear. Yeah. I don't measure my portions. I do not count calories. I eat until I am comfortably stuffed. Until, until the point where I get a, another piece of meat on my fork and go, oh, I'm done. I can't. Because I think that's the way we always did it. Right. Right. And if you're eating a proper human diet that contains foods that humans ancestrally ate, I think that your hunger hormones and your other satiety signals will tell you that's it, Bubba, you're done. No more. Right. But if you're eating highly processed, ultra processed, high carb, low fat foods, you never get that signal. And so you can definitely overeat, even on a paleo diet that was, you know, full of uh, spaghetti squash and quinoa and sweet potatoes, I could overeat all day long. Mm -hmm. But on a on a carnivore or ketovore, which is a very meat heavy keto, I when I'm done, I'm done, right. And so I may eat a second time that day, depending on if I'm hungry, or what the family's doing, or I may not eat a second time, I let my hunger be the guide. And that's another thing when you're eating the standard American diet, you think you're always hungry. You cannot hear or feel your true physiological hunger signals. They're right. hidden from you. But when you're eating a proper human diet, you can actually hear those signals. And, and the average person walking the street has never been truly hungry their entire life. They don't even know what it feels like, right? They've never been truly thirsty unless they're an athlete and they don't know what that feels like because they're told you need to drink a gallon of water a day. You need to eat every two hours. And so they just live their entire life in this, in this mashed up, mixed up uh, soup of, of hormones that are improperly balanced mm -hmm. and they never know what it feels like to be truly hungry or truly thirsty. And I think that's sad because those, those feelings are so such a part of our, our genetic being, our ancestral being that I think you need to experience those things to know what they feel like. Yeah. I mean, I talk about that a lot is that's the one thing that's so powerful with fasting is just abstaining from food, how much you can learn about what really true hunger is. Yes. And, uh, you know, it takes time to get there. I'm curious. I mean, you at one point were about 300 pounds. How much yeah. do you weigh now? 
So I'm, I'm, I'm almost back to my current weight, which is 230. Uh, I misbehaved over the, the holidays and I eat lots of keto treats and lots of <laughs> almond flour cookies and coconut flour pancakes and gained about five pounds and, and probably four and a half pounds of that were just fluid and inflammation. And I'm now back this morning. I was 231. I've been back on the, the straight and narrow. And uh, I think over this year, I'm probably going to try to drop another five and get down to about 225. Uh, which is still, that's heavy for me. When I graduated high school, I weighed 185 pounds. Mm. But my wife has advised me that there may be legal ramifications if I try to get back to 185. <laughs> As in, she may divorce me because I'll be too skinny. And so I, I, I do carry a lot more muscle now naturally. And I, and, and I don't, I'm not a big workout fanatic at all. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't believe that, but it's really true. I don't work out on any set schedule or anything like that. Uh, but I just tend to carry a lot more natural muscle and a lot less fat naturally by eating this way. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the things I, I noticed in one of your blogs was, um, we'll touch on it briefly, but you know, you talked about seven natural ways to raise testosterone. Yeah. I thought that'd be sort of a cool topic to talk about, especially with the audience for this, for this episode. So oh, absolutely. Why, why don't we touch on that? What are your seven ways? Yeah, so I probably don't remember all seven, but uh, <laughs> I, I wrote yeah. I wrote them down. So, so I got you. Good. I got you. So basically, when eating a meat heavy diet is going to raise your your testosterone. Right. Uh, eating the, fat. The, the right. precursor molecule of testosterone is cholesterol. In fact, all of the the sex hormones come from cholesterol. That's how the body makes them. And so not taking a cholesterol lowering medication, that's going to raise your testosterone. Eating a fatty meat heavy diet is going to raise it working out really hard. And so I, I said earlier, I, I don't follow any schedule, but when I get done, I've got a, I've got a, a hex bar out in the garage that I've got 235 pounds on. And I'm going to go out there and I'm going to, I'm going to do one set of as many deadlifts as I can. Mm-hmm. And that's literally going to be my workout for today. Yeah. The, and, and these micro workouts, you keep hearing about them, but you know, like Brad Kearns and guys that I talk to, uh, you know, this is sort of the new thing, just increasing the volume. You can do them, you can do them more than once a day if you want, but like yep. 10 minute workout, yep. it could be, you know, it can make a difference. Huge difference. Yeah. yeah. And so some days I'll, I'll get my, my shoes on. And I'll, we've got three acres here in Nashville. And I'll go to the back and I'll sprint to the front. And I might do that two or three times. I do it until I get bored with it. Then I stop doing it. Right. Right. And, and I may not do that again for a week. And so I, I truly don't follow any kind of bodybuilding or workout regimen. Those things bore me incredibly. Mm -hmm. I have terrible ADD. And if you said, hey, you need to go jog on the treadmill for 30 minutes, I'd probably shoot myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the thing about these micro workouts that I love and I've been doing them as well is there's no really excuse because you don't have to go to the gym for an hour and a half. It doesn't take that much time. And like you said, you, you're doing them around your house. So it sort of takes the excuses out, which is yeah. nice. Yeah. And it also, it's fun. I mean, after I do a couple of, it's probably 250 yards. I do two 250 yards flat out saber tooth tigers trying to catch me <laughs> prints. I don't warm up. I don't warm down. I just go out there because I don't think we really warmed up. Right. hundred thousand years ago, if you saw a saber tooth, you ran right. right then. You didn't warm up and do some jumping jacks. And so I'll do a couple of those and I, and the entire day looks and feels different after I do that or after I go out there and do 15 or 20, deadlifts till I just can't do another one that literally can change the traje trajectory, including the mental trajectory of your entire day. And I think it's probably best done uh, in the morning. Don't know if that's true, but I, I feel like it is for me at least, but doing that once a day or every other day, it, it can change your mental health. Yeah. And as far as boosting testosterone, I also, you know, wrote down, Decrease in simple carbs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Decrease in stress, obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Vitamin, what else you got? yeah. Vitamin D is a big Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Yeah. So the in the cholesterol molecule uses vitamin D in order to make hundreds of different compounds in your body and most of the hormones. 
And the majority of adults in the United States and indeed the modern world are deficient in vitamin D. Right. And we keep hearing about this in relation to uh, oh, certain viral infections that we right. won't mention and other things. And absolutely, vitamin, vitamin D is vital for every function pretty much of the human body. Optimal function, that is. Yeah. And then um, gut health wrote in there as well. Sure. Yeah. And I think, I think gut health is something we don't understand at all. The microbiome, we don't understand it all. <clears throat> and so currently, let me just give everybody a piece of advice. If you see an ad or you hear a podcast and somebody says, hey, send me a sample of your poop or, or your DNA, and I will tell you every food you should eat and every food you should avoid, mm -hmm. that's a waste of money. Yeah. We currently do not have, we're not anywhere close to having the information we need about either the gut bi microbiome or your DNA to be able to predict what foods you should eat or what foods you should avoid, what, what uh, diseases you're more likely to get because it completely ignores the epigenetic, the kind of the second and probably much more important part of uh, the genetic equation. And then the gut microbiome, dude, we're literally cavemen stumbling around in the dark. We're like the, the, the blind men feeling the elephant when it comes to the microbiome. Do I think it's exquisitely important? Yes, it's mm -hmm. huge. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be game changing for probably many areas of medicine and nutrition and science. But as currently, we don't know what the hell we're talking about when it comes to the, the microbiome. Yeah, it's it's such a it's a complicated area, uh, but vitally important. And I think that uh, you know, like the elimination diet, which you would think of something like a carnivore diet. You know, if if you're having gut issues, um, that that might be something to turn to because you know yes. then you'll sort of figure out you know well what foods are causing this and what aren't and you know, if yep. you can do some type of elimination diet, like you're talking about. It could probably yeah, we've had hundreds of, if not thousands of people reach out to us after doing a 90 day carnivore challenge and say, my, my irritable bowel is gone. Whether it was constipation predominant or diarrheal, it's just, it's 99% better. My Crohn's is in remission. My, I haven't had a single diverticulitis flare up. I haven't had any problems with my gut whatsoever since I did the, the 90 day carnivore challenge. Cause most people, if they have a serious gut issue and a diet makes it go away, they tend to stick to that diet because the, the gut issues can be pretty darn severe. Right. And so, yeah, if anybody's got any kind of gut issue, I had, I had severe daily heartburn when I was even on paleo, hmm. but it got 80% better with keto and now on carnivore. That's why I'm still a carnivore is because I have zero heartburn. I have taken nothing for heartburn in over 18 months. And for anybody out there who suffers from severe reflux, they know just how much that sucks. And so yeah. I would I would prefer to eat meat the rest of my life than to ever have heartburn again for one day. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, one of the questions that I ask a lot of my guests uh, towards the end is, what, what one tip would you give someone like a middle-aged individual that maybe they're in their forties and fifties and you know, they've lost it a little bit, right? They want to get their body back to what it once was maybe 10, 15 years ago. What, what one tip would you give to them? Yeah. The, the one thing I would say to them is that I was in your shoes. Hundreds of thousands of people were in your shoes and they now no longer live like that. And with, with those complications, there is hope. There, and, and the hope does not lie in a handful of prescription medications or a handful of supplements either. The hope lies in eating a proper human diet. Mm -hmm. When I first started recommending keto years ago to my patients, it was as a temporary weight loss hack. I didn't, I didn't think it was helpful for anything else. I didn't think it would maybe not even safe for long term. But now, through, through the years of study, I have come to the conclusion that a very low carbohydrate diet full of fatty meat. And I think there's a spectrum. It can be low carb, it can be keto, ketovore, carnivore. It can be strict carnivore or, or, or you know, lazy carnivore, whatever. <laughs> that spectrum is the proper human diet for all human beings on this planet of any age with any medical condition whatsoever. Uh, there, there is, you, and I think it's quickly becoming inarguable. 
but there's hope for you. You don't have to be morbidly obese the rest of your life. You don't have to have this list of chronic medical problems that keep getting worse. You don't have to keep taking more and more and more prescription medication. You, there is hope and the hope is in your hands. There's no gatekeeper. That's the other beautiful thing I love about this is you don't even have to go to a doctor to, to tap into this super powerful, super ancient healing technology. It's it, your body's already got it built in. Now all you've got to do is just feed it the proper food and things will start to go back to normal. Inflammation will start to decrease. Arthritis that you thought you were crippled with for the rest of your life will start to almost magically get less severe. Bowel complaints, skin complaints, uh, mental health. We've had mm -hmm. so many thousand people say, as long as I eat keto or carnivore, my OCD is, it, it literally doesn't bother me. My depression, my anxiety, my ADD, just so much better when I eat what Dr. Barry calls a proper human diet. And so the question then becomes, are all these diseases, these epidemics of chronic diseases, are they just the, are they the, are they the inheritance of modern humans? Is that's just what we're stuck with? Or are they being induced and produced by the diet we're being told to eat. Yeah, no, I, I, that's a great, great way to finish things up. And uh, a lot of that's also, I got your book right here. I'll give it a little, there we go. Ah, cool. <laughs> when, when's your next one coming out? Uh, some, uh, anywhere within the next six months to six years. <laughs> but oh, it, good. It's, okay. being worked on. it's being worked on. Okay. It's, it's tentatively titled the proper human diet. Hmm. And that's a, that's a big bite to take. I know, yeah. but uh, I'm going to see what I can do with that subject. Well, I love it. And well, I'll have to get you back on when that book hopefully comes out before six years. <laughs> yeah, love to, man. And the, you know, I, I love your message because the fact that you're just a, you know, you're a board first board certified physician that probably all this stuff you didn't get trained on, right? You learned this all yourself. Yes. I think that would be the biggest hope, right? I talked to Dr. Gary Schleifer, who uh, is also um, a family physician um, out of the West Coast. And that would be the biggest goal is to have um, our doctors being trained in this, in this, you know, way of teaching. Um, and I think it would um, go a long way. Yeah. And, and they actually are being trained but they're being trained in a very unusual model currently. They're not being trained by their professors and by the, the organizations. They're being trained by their patients one, one at a time. And it's, it's pretty intriguing and interesting mm -hmm. and uh, hopeful to see that, that doctors like, like me and others can see changes in our patients and go, dude, how'd you do that? And then learn from that. And that's currently how doctors are being trained in, in nutrition in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was great. We could probably talk for hours, but uh, thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Barry. Absolutely. And um, I look forward to speaking to you down the road. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I'll see you next time. Okay, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine, and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.